This episode of The Unstarving Musician is powered by Banzoogle, helping musicians around the world create professional artist websites. I somewhat recently moved my own artist website over to Banzoogle. You can see it at urbanzo.com. I'm a longtime WordPress user and website designer, so trying a system like Banzoogle was kind of a big deal to me. But I know that WordPress ain't that easy to learn, and lots of musicians have no interest in learning how to use WordPress, but will try something purported to be easy to use. Well, it doesn't get much easier than Banzoogle. I've talked about the numerous features they have at the front end of other episodes, but after talking to Dave Cool, VP of Business Development with Banzoogle, I learned about several other features that are especially interesting right now, such as crowdfunding, subscriptions, donations, and all of that without fees added. They also have tools to help you sell merch, tickets to your shows, build your email list, and more. They have support seven days a week. So look, go to Banzoogle.com to start a 30-day free trial. You can use the promo code Robonzo to get 15% off your first year. That's Banzoogle.com, promo code Robonzo, R-O-B-O-N-Z-O. Let's do the show. Greetings, rock stars, and welcome to another episode of The Unstarving Musician. I'm your host, Robonzo. On this podcast, I have conversations with independent music artists and industry professionals. It's all intended to help indie artists be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love, which is, of course, to make music. Do you want to help others find this podcast? You can do so by subscribing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. It really does help. The Unstarving Musician podcast is made possible through the generosity of listeners like you. One of the easiest ways to offer support is to join the Unstarving Musician community, and you can do so by going to unstarvingmusician.com and join right there on the homepage. As a member, you'll receive from me tips and lessons you can use in your music journey. And this is not just stuff coming from me and my years of experience as a gigging musician, but also from the hundreds of other musicians I've talked to as part of this project and podcast. You'll also get a free copy of the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs ebook, And that is all free just for being part of the community. To learn more about the other ways of offering your support, please visit our sponsor page at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor. This episode is powered by ConvertKit. More than just an email marketing company, ConvertKit is focused on landing pages too in order to give beginner creators the ability to build a quick website and start gathering email addresses. I've been a ConvertKit user since early 2016. My my, how time flies. ConvertKit's new free plan allows creators to make unlimited landing pages and forms. You can choose from multiple templates, add personalization and design, include an incentive email, create a thank you page, manage subscribers, and send broadcast emails. Plus, you'll get access to the ConvertKit community page where you can join groups, follow topics, post questions and comments, and interact with other creators. To connect with your audience and make a living doing work you love with ConvertKit, go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash ConvertKit. My guest for this episode is Zach O'Malley Greenberg, author of A-List Angels, How a Band of Actors, Artists, and Athletes Hacked Silicon Valley. I lived 17 years in the Silicon Valley in in and around San Jose, in case you haven't uh, heard me talk about it on the podcast before. So I was kind of interested in this book for various reasons. Zach was referred to me by Ryan Carella of the Break the Business podcast. Thank you, Ryan. Zach and I talk a bit about his gig as senior editor of media entertainment at Forbes magazine and uh, how he started that gig right out of college writing about stock picks. Zach explains how it connects to his current work at Forbes as and as an author in It all goes back to hip-hop, beginning with a 2007 Forbes list of top-earning rappers in the world. His new book offers lessons to all indie artists, which is why I have him on the podcast here for you to listen to today. And knowing what I know about the subject matter, it's a compelling read, too. Learn more about Zach, his work, and his latest book at zogreenberg.com. All right, here's me and Zach O'Malley-Greenberg. Before we, Indeed, yeah. yeah, before we get into your new book, I just wanted to give some perspective to um, listeners of the Unstarving Musician about uh, something that's a big part of your life. So, you're senior editor of media and entertainment at Forbes magazine. How long have you been there, and how did you find your way there? 
Yeah, so uh, I started about a decade ago and um, ended up coming at right after college. Uh, I was an intern for a couple of years and found that I really enjoyed writing stock picks, actually. Um, there, there was sort of a rhythm to it, and you would dig into the numbers and, you know, make a thesis, talk to some analysts, and then, you know, come up with a, a reason why somebody should buy or sell a stock. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why they had like a college uh, junior senior doing this, but there was plenty of adult supervision. So that was kind of my entree <laughs> into, uh, into this whole space. Yeah. Well, well that um, makes weird sense to me only because I, it looks like, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like a, a great body of your more recent work has been around um, not just entertainment and media, but the financial aspects of it that are, are the lives of in, the particular case of my interest in um, in music artists and entertainment artists, so it has a weird sort of uh, uh, career segue for me. That are they real? Are they as related as they seem to me? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny how I, I kind of made the jump from from the sort of the, the hard business side to the uh, entertainment business side, and um, you know, it, it really all kind of goes back to hip hop for me. Anyway, it was uh, I guess it was two thousand seven. And an editor walked into my cubicle and she said, Hey, would you like to help me put together the first ever list of the top earning rappers in the world? Uh, and I said, yes, of course. And, um, basically we kind of concluded that, uh, the, the, one of the highest paid rappers at the time was Tupac, even though he was dead. So I wrote a story about that. And then we did a little bit, um, called the hip hop cash Kings, which we put as sort of a sidebar, um, five people who, uh, you know, who, who were making the most in the business in terms of living rappers. And it was Jay-Z, Diddy, um, and 50 Cent, I believe, or one, two, and three on there. Come on, say it right. Then it was say Dr. Dre. Right. Uh, who's next? <laughs> oh, Diddy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I still so, do that today. Sorry. So, uh, you know, um, yeah. So, you know, we put out the story and I kind of thought nothing of it and, not nothing of it, but I just, you know, I thought, all right, that's, that's, you know, that'll be a good one. And, um, you know, in those days as you did, you waited for the magazine to come out and, and weren't really sure when it would go live on the web. And, um, and lo and behold, uh, you know, uh, I was out in, I think it was New Mexico driving around looking for another story, um, in the desert. And all of a sudden on the radio comes the song and it's like, Forbes, one, two, three, I get money, I get money. And, um, and it turned out that it was Jay-Z, 50 Cent, and Diddy uh, who were all, you know, kind of like celebrating their inclusion uh, on this list. And they each had a verse and there was this whole, you know, the whole remix of the song that 50 Cent had done, uh, excuse me, 50 Cent. And, um, you know, and uh, and it ended up being kind of like a, like a cult hit and came back to New York and, and everybody was kind of like, wow, you know, uh, I think we're on to something. So, uh, but you know, on a more serious note, I think that, you know, people hadn't been taking hip hop that seriously in the mainstream business press. Um, and so here I came and, you know, kind of tried to make this a mission of mine to, to treat a serious business seriously. Um, and you know, that editor soon left and then I took over the hip hop, uh, thing full time and and have been kind of helming it ever since. It went on to to kind of expanding our coverage and um, media and entertainment and, and uh, running some of our other franchises in that in that range. Um, you know, both earnings stuff and just regular feature stories and our under thirty franchise, which has been a big thing over the past uh, five ten years now. So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a fun perch to be looking at the business from. Yeah, it sounds like a fun, just like a fun gig that you have too. And um, and since uh, our mutual friend Ryan Carella of the Break the Business podcast connected us, I, I learned about these other titles that um, fit in very nicely with, to me anyway, um, just looking at them with Three Kings. And that was a cool story, by the way, but um, Michael Jackson, Inc. and um, Empire State of Mind on on uh, how Jay-Z went from, you know, street corner to corner office, as the title says. The the new book, which is, I guess, what, um, well, is what had Ryan think of 
uh, connecting us, um, A-list angels, how a band of actors, artists, and athletes hacked Silicon Valley. Kind of um, takes a little bit of a left turn. Not really, but a little bit. Or maybe you'll say, yeah, it takes it definitely takes a big left turn, but um, mm-hmm. still obviously talking about um, entertainment, the world of entertainment, but uh, and, and, and the financials that are so um, connected at a certain level, but um, I, at least from reading a summary of it, kind of talking about these guys getting more into the world of venture uh, capitalism, and, and maybe much more than that. So tell me, I guess, first of all, um, clearly you got some enjoyment from the titles that preceded this, or it looked like looks like you did because you did, <laughs> you know, those three and maybe others that I didn't mention, and prob- prob- and I'm sure, um, in fact, from looking over some of your pieces at Forbes a number of, of things related specifically um, to, you know, the financial power of some of these entertainers. But um, what's the story that led you to, to create A-List Angels, to write A-List Angels? Yeah, and, you know, it, it's funny. I mean, in, in um, my job at Forbes, I'm really lucky because I get to talk to some of the most interesting people in the world, and that's entertainers, but it's also like, you know, the CEO of Union Pacific and learning about uh, railways. I don't know. I kind of nerd out on that, on that stuff too, but, but people don't tend to want to interview me about it so much, but like, uh, <laughs> it's always funny to me how, you know, the, the CEO of Union Pacific Railroad, which is, you know, this multi-billion dollar company, you know, I walk in and, and, you know, and to his office in Omaha and, we start talking. He's like, Oh, you know, you, you know, you know a little bit about me. I, this is amazing. I'm like, yeah, I'm writing a story about you. What do you expect? But, but there's a level of um, humility there. And, and sometimes you talk to like, I don't know, the, the head of the sub 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 label and they have a bigger ego um, than the head of, of like union Pacific uh, railroad. So, um, and, and then, you know, it, it's just, I think there's a, sometimes people hang out too long with rock stars. They, they let it uh, get into their head uh, that they're a rock star. And um, you know, like to me, I think the fascinating stuff about all this is yeah, just talking to interesting people uh, all day. And, the, and that's what I get to do. And I'm really, I'm really lucky about it. My wife's a psychiatrist and we say that we have the exact same job except that I have to write about it and she can't, you know, she has to keep it, uh, you know, uh, confidential. And, um, <laughs> except when something's off the record, obviously I can go out with it. But, um, but yeah, so for Ashton, the, the story, uh, I mean, I, I say for A-list angels, the story was Ashton Kutcher and I'd been following his career for quite some time. And I mentioned 50 cent earlier, turns out he was inspired by 50 cent, uh, investing in vitamin water and, and, and kind of taking equity instead of cash in, ter- in terms of endorsement. And um, this is in the late, you know, mid to late aughts. And, and Ashton was like, why am I sitting here taking cash, for, you know, to do an endorsement deal? Um, so, you know, he started investing and, and that was just as social media was kind of getting big. He started putting money into Foursquare and Skype and, and some of these other platforms um, and, and, he was one of the first to a million on Twitter. I think he was the first actually. And so all these startups were like, let's get Ashton Kutcher to tweet about our company and maybe we'll give him some equity or let him invest. So he took the time and really went up to Hollywood, you know, from Hollywood to Silicon Valley and, and started, you know, making those connections. And, um, and after a few years, I started to hear more about it and reporting on the business and, and finally uh, connected in, in 2016 and did a cover story on how he and his business partner, Guy Osiri, who manages U2 and Madonna, uh, how they had created this giant fund um, called uh, uh, first one was called a grade. And now they have one called sound ventures, but basically they had convinced billionaires to give them money to invest. They raised $30 million and they started putting it into companies like Uber and Airbnb. And this is, you know, in the early, let's say early 2010s um, and uh, at insanely low valuations and, as time went on, you know, that, that 30 million turned into something like over a quarter of a billion. Um, and they, you know, they did something like, uh, an eight, eight and a half X return is my math right. That sounds about right. Um, and the, the Forbes story was basically like, let's dive into this trend, you know, stars are starting to invest in startups, but 
here's here's sort of like the big kahuna of the whole situation and um and let's you know like tell this story for the first time i remember it came up as these things do kind of last minute and so i ended up um writing like half of the story on top of a volcano in hawaii and like a van <laughs> in a parking lot <laughs> uh, uh but you know it, it it went up and it you know kind of kind of gave this look into deep look inside and um after it came out, I thought, you know, there, there's so much more to it than just him. It's a whole ecosystem of, of folks doing it. There's athletes and um, musicians in addition to, to actors and so forth. And, uh, and I thought, you know, this ought to be my, my next, my next big book. And, um, and of course, you know, I didn't really try to plan it so that it would come out uh, like in the middle of the biggest crisis um, a public health crisis in you know decades, uh, but that's that's what it did, and um, and so it's not exactly the most topical right now, but it's definitely uh, counter programming, you know, like, and I think in some ways, although you could say it's about a story of the rich getting richer, um, it does go back to this notion of um, how do creators, you know, become owners. And I think that's such an important lesson, especially, sure, you think now musicians and actors and athletes, you know, are these big multimillionaires um, and sometimes billionaires um, in the case of some of the, the folks that, uh, that I cover. But um, going back for most of, the, most of the past century, they, you know, they were kind of like wage laborers they were employed by studios and record labels who really kind of exploited them right. who who you know owned their work right mm -hmm. and um what they're doing now in terms of being in, able to invest in startups like uber and airbnb etc um maybe not to the greatest examples of given what's going on you know these days but um be, let's say something like spotify right um which is also, you know, the, the very platform that for a lot of folks is, is getting their, their creations out there to, to be able to own a piece of that um, is just such a departure from the situation, uh, you know, so many decades ago. And, um, and I think it, it is sort of like a story. It's a blueprint um, for taking back ownership and, you know, and, and, and kind of like, you know, having a blueprint for creating your own future and, and creating your own kind of generational wealth, especially when you start to see, um, you know, the, the folks who are, who are at the forefront of this, tr of this trend, you know, Serena yeah. Williams, Kevin Durant, um, you know, maybe coming from neighborhoods and places that, that don't have role models like that. Um, you know, now they're starting to see people who look like them who come from places like where they came from, and, and are also inspired to, you know, to look at other like different kind of career paths than they might have thought of before. Right. And, you know, I, um, for musicians or independent artists who aren't at this level and maybe have this moment where they do, as you said, look at it as just stories of the rich getting richer. I think underneath all these stories, there are definitely lessons, as you point out. And, and in fact, I listened to Ashton Kutcher on, I believe, Mark Maron's uh, podcast and the stories actually um i mean you know if you listen to the whole of it and, and the interviewer helps of course but uh you know there's a bit of a humble story in there about how it all worked and it certainly seems that there are applications at at all levels and and for some i'm sure will <laughs> inspire them to you know reach these uh greater greater heights of of ownership um ryan Carella, to mention him again he had said one of the, you know he underscored in, in an email introduction that um, there are some lessons to offer indie artists on the importance of keeping equity on projects. So when you you know maybe look down the uh, echelons or ladder of where artists can be at with regards to the progression of their career, their fame, or their uh, net worth, where do you see lessons for? artists that are, are starting out or haven't yet achieved something that they may be on the way to doing? I mean, I think to go back to Ashton Kutcher, you know, the, the lesson here, in addition to, to owning and, and kind of being focused on that aspect um, of the business, you know, I think that there's this really crucial bit that 
that he said in, in my, in my interview with him, which is, um, you know, he explained how he would go up to Silicon Valley and, uh, he would, he would just ask questions. Like he said, I would try to ask a lot of dumb questions and he assumed that he was the dumbest guy in the room. And that was fine. Maybe he was, and maybe they assumed he was too. So it wasn't like anybody was going to dock him for, you know, asking what's a cap table or, um, you know, uh, how does this work? And like, what's pre money versus post money and, and all that. Um, and you know, a lot of people are intimidated, um, just in general to ask questions when they're going into something, but then, you know, you kind of get into this spot of like, you've kind of nodded your head along and then everybody assumes that, you know, what you're talking about, but then you're, you know, you're kind of, you're in over your head and, uh, and you don't really have a chance to, to kind of recover and, and figure out what's actually going on. So he was just like, no, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I don't care if people think I'm stupid. Um, I'm just going to go for it. Uh, and you know, he, he was able to, to accumulate quite a lot of knowledge and, and pretty soon he, he wasn't the dumbest person in the room anymore. And, you know, these days when you hear him talk about startups, he, he has the lingo and the jargon of a, of a real Silicon Valley veteran. It doesn't mean, you know, just cause you have jargon doesn't mean that you're the best brightest in the room. But, um, but I think the moral of the story is, you know, when you're in that stage of your career, whatever it is, ask those questions that you think are dumb and, and, um, you know, better to get them out of the way early <laughs> to, so, so that, so that later, you know, uh, you, you're the expert. Yeah. And, you know, I hope I'm not confusing the story because, um, I'd also, consumed a podcast story uh, on uh, recently on Adam Curry, and I, I kind of knew a little bit about uh, this story outside of MTV that he had that's kind of connected to podcasting, but um, he talks about the early days in a very similar fashion of, of his investing in kind of a similar fashion to the way Ashton Kutcher did. And I guess I only bring it up because one of them, I'm, I'm, I think I'm thinking of Ashton Kutcher's interview, but um, he was really paying attention to trends um, uh, on the uh, internet, and uh, started raising, you know, raising um, uh, funds for for ventures on his own. Seems like fairly early in the journey. Correct me if I'm wrong, because maybe I'm, I'm, you know, kind of confusing the stories. But I guess all that to say that uh, he was really uh, observing a lot, as you say, he was asking a lot of questions, and uh, he found, you know, he he aligned himself with people that. Uh, believed in his vision at the very earliest point in all this but uh yeah and it looks like he's he's uh made some good <laughs> some good scores in silicon valley and some good decisions and maybe a little luck too yeah for sure and um you know i think when you start to look at the the overall numbers i mean uh I mean, he invested in hundreds and hundreds of startups both on his own i mean a combination of his own and through the fund and um you know you go through the list and it's I mean, I don't have the list in front of me, but it's just, you know, uh, Uber, Airbnb, Warby Parker, um, you know, uh, Spotify, uh, yeah, there's some pretty wild ones in there. There's this one called Cowlar, um, which is, they call Fitbit for cows. Mm -hmm. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's all over the place, but he brings a different kind, kind of value to, to each one. And, and, um, and I think that's, you know, it's not just, Ashton Kutcher can do that. It's any, any sort of entertainer who gets into this stuff. And so what he did, you know, he went on Colbert and he started talking about his investments and he did like a whole five minute bit on Cowlar and how it's this thing. It's like a Fitbit for a cow and you put it on the cow <laughs> and the, you know, you can tell by the way the cow is moving, if the cow is pregnant or injured and you know, even before a farmer could tell. And so you're able to, you know, you're able to help the cow um, live more comfortably, but you're also able to save money for yourself as a farmer, knowing, you know, when some of these things are, are happening and, and to be being able to respond proactively instead of, um, you know, having to treat, uh, you know, have, preventative measures to keep a cow um, from getting really sick versus like having to take care of a cow when the cow is already sick. And uh, he went on and on and on. And, um, and, you know, you think like, well, what does a Hollywood star know about, you know, a farming startup? Uh, and, and, you know, he doesn't need to know anything. And the point is, you know, farmers watch Colbert. And after the show, I mean, for, for the book, I interviewed the, the founder of, of this company. He was like, yeah, after the show, you know, the, the, the demand, the inquiries were just like off the chart. People were calling up, like, how do I get your thing? And, um, you know, they, they were sold out. Um, 
kind of stretching on into, into infinity, uh, because of it. So, you know, I think that's kind of like the, the power that, um, that, that these folks can bring to some, some of these companies, even ones that you wouldn't necessarily think would be in their wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny, the, the product idea and its obscurity and, and also very clever <laughs> that Ashton Kutcher and I'm sure some of his uh, peers in this arena do similar types of things, um, in the places they choose to, to discuss, um, these ventures. So a uh, sidetrack question, are you a musician? Uh, I did acapella in college and that was sort of the extent of it. Um, you know, beyond the uh, karaoke, which I guess I don't really do. I thought so I saw a guitar amp in your life. Yeah. I, you know, I do have a guitar amp in my office, but it, it's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So she plays then. Very yeah. Nice. She plays, she'll tell you she doesn't play anything, but she kind of secretly plays like seven instruments. Um, <laughs> she kind of dabbles, you know, uh, but, uh, but she, but she can, you know, I mean, she has a, she's, she's a doctor, um, but she was in a, a med school band back in the day. Uh, you know, they, they played some gigs. She can, she can shred a little bit. Um, so she undersells herself, though, but she's the musician nice. in the family. I just read and about did it. You, um, your interest in, in music, uh, you, you kind of mentioned that the path or the progression of writing and, and entertainment and media goes back to hip hop. Is that were you or were you genuinely a fan, um, or or I mean, was yeah, was that your main one of your big uh, uh, areas of music consumption, or just something that you're interested in for various reasons? Um, no, I mean, I've been into hip hop ever since I started buying my own music, honestly. Uh, I, I remember pretty clearly the first time I went out um, with uh, whatever it was, you know, $45 in my pocket, and I bought three CDs. This was in, I want to say it was like 1996 or maybe 97, 96. So 96. I think I was in sixth grade. And uh, yeah, and I bought... Um, I bought Sublime Sublime. I bought the Titanic soundtrack <laughs> and I bought uh, uh Puff Daddy No Way. And uh, you know, I would say I, I followed like the the first and the last offshoot, you know, like paths um with my music taste a little more than the, the middle one. Um that's not a discredit to Celine Dion. She's amazing. I write about her a lot. She makes a ton of money <laughs> um, in Las Vegas, but uh yeah, I would say I tend toward um, hip hop for sure, and um, alt rock or grunge rock, in, in particular, um, on that side of things. But you know, we're not getting a ton of new alt or grunge these days. Um, but hip hop, you know, I mean, it, growing up in New York, it's like you're surrounded with hip hop. It's it's hard, almost hard, not to be a hip hop <laughs> head, and um, and in a funny way that you know, like Diddy and and you know that sort of like commercial mid to late nineties hip hop isn't necessarily like late bad boy. Maybe isn't considered to be, um, the, the best, uh, hip hop of all time, but, um, just the samples that are used, you know, uh, got me kind of interested in, in old school stuff. And, you know, whether it's, uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious five, or, you know, or, or even some of the rock samples, the Bowie samples, um, yeah, I didn't know who any of these people were until I, until I heard the, um, the Puff Daddy songs. Mm. So, you know, it was in, in a way a gateway to a lot of other That's stuff for me. And strangely on my end, you know, um, I've ended up covering Diddy himself quite a bit, um, you know, and, uh, and, and being able to kind of put a, like a, I don't want to say a face to a name, but like a, like a, like an interaction to a, to a name, um, and yeah, I think he's one of the more fascinating uh, moguls out there in, in music because, you know, I kind of think of him like if Richard Branson happened to ha have done a stint as a rapper, right? He's just like <laughs> this insane businessman who's got his hand in all these different things. And there was this period of time where he happened to be, you know, talking about Diddy back when he was Puff Daddy, like the biggest star in hip hop pop R and B crossover, whatever for, for several years. And then he just kind of like, you know, kind of doubled down on the business side of things. And, and that's been his focus. So, um, you know, he, uh, he's managed to stay relevant, I think just for such a long time, despite not really having much new music or really much like critically acclaimed mm -hmm. music. 
um, which I, I find to be quite a feat. Yeah, absolutely. And with the onset of our new way of life here, so we're, for anybody who might be listening in the future, uh, well, they definitely will be, but in, in somewhat distant future. Um, so we're recording our conversation here on April 24, 2020. So given what's going on now, what are you, so you just put out a book, I guess rather rather than start with the work life, and you can kind of segue into that, but um, since you fairly recently published this book and knowing that there's a certain amount of activity that is wrapped around um, ensuring the book's success. And fortunately, you have a lot of things that help with that, but I assume that you do a lot of this, um, similar types of um, marketing-related things to to get the book out there. Um, what has You've done this before, so what has changed? What are you doing differently, if anything? I assume you're doing some things differently. What are you doing differently and then also as an extension, how's it changed, uh, you know, work life as well outside of the book? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if you could hear just then that an ambulance went by. I'm in New York City and um, there's been a lot of that recently, uh, unfortunately. I mean, especially I'd say in, in early April um, for a week there, it was just this constant howl um, at sort of the peak of the leading into the peak of the crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it has gotten uh, it's definitely gotten anecdotally better on that front. Um, and you kind of see it reflected in in some of the numbers. So hopefully whenever the, everybody else is listening to this, it'll be, you know, we'll be even uh, in a, in a better place, um, than we are now. Um, but you know, there's no doubt. I mean, it, it, um, it's had a huge impact on, on launch, uh, kind of stuff. And my book came out the day before, they shut down the NBA and major league baseball and wow. Tom Hanks got the virus and, and all of that. Um, wow. and you know, so I had basically like two days of, of my pride, like my book launch party at the, at the Forbes headquarters downtown. And then I had a couple readings and then, and then that was it. And then I've been inside ever since. So that was, you know, probably what, like a month, uh, a month and a half mm. ago. Um, and it, you know, all my, uh, national dates, tours, stuff, all my, you know, TV, radio stuff from then on, uh, just totally wiped out, um, understandably, you know, because on the, on the, um, on the business radio and, and sort of like national kind of program side of things, it was all, all virus all the time and all markets all the time. And, um, you know, the subject matter in my book, um, is not exact, it was not exactly like, you know, understandably front and center at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, and then on the travel side, no travel. So, you know, no, no LA, San Francisco, uh, Atlanta, Boston events, um, no South by events, which I'd painstakingly set up and so forth. So, you know, it, it, to me really resonated with a lot of musicians I talked to, um, for my day, for my day job and that, you know, having to cancel a, a tour. Um, I'm just lucky, you know, I got paid out in advance, um, for the book. And it's not like, you know, let's say in music where you might put out an album and then, you know, have the album be sort of a loss leader, um, to, to get to the tour and you, and you make a bunch of money on the road. It's, it's the reverse on, on, on books where you would, you know, you, you would, um, you would do the tour as sort of like a promotional, uh, you know, uh, uh, venture to raise attention for the book. Um, so, you know, canceling a book tour certainly, uh, is not great, but, um, you know, I mean, I like to say if that's the worst thing that happens to me throughout all this, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. So, uh, you know, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, much like a lot of musicians, uh, what I've been doing are a lot of podcasts, um, you know, some Instagram lives, uh, you know, that's, that sort of thing. And, you know, just, just trying to get out the book really any way that I, that I can, um, you know, through, through sort of like these non-traditional means. And I think uh, unlike music though, which you, you know, you probably want to listen to regardless of your, of your situation. Um, I, I do think our current moment is a little more subject dependent. So, you know, at the height of it, you probably, you know, you don't want to be reading about, um, uh, entertainers invest, like investing in startups. But, but I do think 
as the demand for counter programming kind of like goes on, you know, um, there, there's going to be a little bit more interest, um, in that sort so of thing. So you reference counter programming a second time, I guess. Can you, can you elaborate? Yeah. Um, you know, counter programming, I, I just think that anything, you know, not having to do with the virus is sort of like, uh, right. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, at some point I just, I, I want to stop hearing about it. You know, I want to, I want to, um, have some space and, and enjoy something or, or kind of like get ready for bed and not be thinking about all this. And, um, so, you know, whether it's reading a book or playing a video game or, or, or what have you, I mean, I think, um, I think we're all kind of looking for, for that, that sort of thing. I think, you know, music obviously is a huge, a huge aspect, um, to that as well as we, as we kind of like settle in deeper into this thing. Yeah. No, I, I, I get it. I get it. Totally get it. Wow. So, um, and then what about work life? Your, what, what, what was it like before, um, things went sideways, <laughs> if I can just put it that way? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Forbes has always been really good to me in terms of the split between the books and the day job. And, um, you know, there's some flexibility as long as I get my work done. Uh, I tend to be a bit of a night owl. So I, you know, I'll, I'll do some of my writing, my, my book writing at night and, um, you know, and then I'll, I'll write, uh, for Forbes by day. Uh, but you know, I think their attitude towards it is like, sure. You know, as long as, as long as you get everything done, I mean, I think they're interested in having experts in different fields. And if, if, you know, you're considered enough of an expert to write a book on something, it's like, all right, well, that's, you know, that's a positive. So let's, let's kind of encourage that. And I do get a lot of, um, story ideas in the book writing process because, you know, these things are planned maybe two years out. Um, it, uh, uh, you know, I'll be talking to somebody and th- they've got a scoop or an idea or something that's happening on a, on a time scale of, you know, days or weeks, um, that I wouldn't be able to use in the book. So I, all right, cool. I can, you know, I've got something, uh, I've got a, an interesting idea to run, um, to, with to Forbes. And by the same token, you know, a lot of times I'll be doing a kind of like a news story and, I I find out about some trend or some kind of like long-term project and, you know, and and it kind of lures me to that. So, um, that's definitely like, uh, you know, a plus of having the, having kind of like the, the the dual role. Um, it, you know, there are moments I think when both gigs become, um, you know, really 24 seven, uh, just, you know, anything, having to do with Kanye West, it seems, um, <laughs> is like a, a round the clock sort of affair. Uh, there's like a whole vortex that goes into place. Um, and you know, for, for the book, certainly like when you're launching, um, or when you're up close to your deadline, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's, it becomes all consuming. I think with the book, you can kind of feel when it's going to be, there's no sort of like breaking, it's rare. There's a, like a breaking book news thing it's like you can sense that you're coming close to your deadline so maybe you take a week of vacation and you know kind of hole up and um you know uh kind of tune out the world and just focus on on doing that but um you know uh fortunately those things don't happen to coincide that often yeah well i i think um there's a lot of relevance right now for independent artists to uh a lot of reasons to check out A-List Angels. Um, it's on my reading list. I, I am certain there are some, <laughs> some stories in there uh, that would be helpful at, and, and inspirational and or inspirational to, to independent artists and music artists in particular, uh, whatever their, their level is, if they're you know, aspiring to, to make a career of it and are thinking ahead. I mean, I think everybody got forced to think about <laughs> diversifying and, uh, looking a little long term and, and, uh, not just depending on that one thing they were doing musically when they're kind of getting, uh, started out. So I think this is, um, um, would be a great read, uh, for them. And I'm sure there are a lot, uh, a number of other audiences that are, are, um, going to be interested and curious about it and, and pick it up. So congratulations on, on getting it out. Um, I, yeah, sorry well, about the unfortunate okay. timing, but Hey, <laughs> uh, you know, um, 
Hey, you know, I mean, I think something like this, hopefully it can become an evergreen. And, and, um, you know, if you're going, if you're in this area of the world, you can something that you could go back to and, uh, and want to learn about. But I think there are just a ton of similarities between entrepreneurs, you know, putting together startups and musicians launching their, you know, their own careers, Mm -hmm. um, because you have to make those same decisions. Like, when do I quit my day job? Um, you know, when do I, when do I sell off part of my thing, whether it's a company or, you know, it's a publishing catalog or, or, uh, you know, masters or something like that. When do I take outside investment, um, versus like trying to go it on my own, you know, when do I sell, uh, you know, a a lot of those same kind of lessons come in and, and, um, you know, I I think it all just kind of comes down to what, um, what you can really tolerate. Like, can you, you know, are you really willing to slog it out and are you, you know, single and no family and, and you don't have to worry about that. Or are you in a position where you need, you know, you need a payment, you need to put a roof over your kid's head and yeah, maybe you take that advance. Um, and then you, and then, you know, you worry about renegotiating it later, you know? Um, so I I do think that there are a ton of parallels between, uh, between the, the worlds of music and, and, um, and, you know, entrepreneur, entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Zach, thanks again for spending time with me. Best of luck um, on the book. I, I know it's going to do well. And uh, take care, man. You guys are right in the center of everything. And, and I know it, it uh, for, for all the bearing down it, it does on, on me where I am and people all over the world, I know that you're at a place where it must bear down pretty hard. So uh, it means a lot to me that you came on here today, man, and I appreciate it. Hey, and I, and I really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to have me on and hope you stay safe down there as well. Hey, thanks again for listening. If you are loving the podcast, please visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor to learn about the various ways that you can offer your support. And again, if you're a listener, I consider you a supporter, especially if you shared it with a friend. Thank you. Look for show notes and links to most everything mentioned in this episode at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast. Thanks so much for listening. With a whole lot of gratitude, peace, love, and more cowbell. Hey there, one last thing before you go. At the time of this recording, music artists and other creators are facing unusual and uncertain times. I'd like to help out if I can. My contribution is to offer you an opportunity to work with me in a coaching capacity and to only pay what you can afford if you can afford to pay anything at all. Think of it as a virtual tip jar. The point is, I'm here for you if you feel you need the help. There's a bit of a process, but it's pretty simple. Just go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash coaching. There's a button on that page to schedule a 15-minute consult call with me. This is just a call to find out how and if I can help you, and it's also an opportunity for you to find out if you want to work with me and for me to find out if I want to work with you. If we both feel good about it, we'll schedule your sessions and I'll also answer any questions you have about how it works, including the pay what you want or what you can afford tip jar thing. So go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash coaching to learn more. I'll have a limited number of slots, obviously, so if this sounds like something you can use right now, go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash coaching to learn more and or to get started. Ciao.